Good morning. Guys, <clears throat> we're going to get ready to start reading chapter 12, A Gift. I don't know if we remember what uh, we had just read, but yesterday, um, if you had read yesterday or whenever you read before the last chapter, um, uh, the Eldritch, she had put, Madam, she touched her forehead, and then all of a sudden, Sophia started to fall asleep. She let go of the bookcase and collapsed to the floor. Let me check real quick. Yeah, we'll do half of this one. We'll be about to... Yeah, about. Okay. So, chapter 12, A Gift. Sophie stirred in the darkness. She opened her eyes to find herself curled up in a leather bench, her body rocking back and forth in a lurching rhythm. She thought for a moment she was back in the oubliette, but then realized that she could hear hoofbeats. She was in a moving carriage. A single lamp hung from the ceiling. It swung from side to side, drawing odd shadows across the floor. Madame Eldritch sat across the carriage with Taro at her side. Between them lay the Book of Who. You're finally awake, the woman said, looking away from the moonlit window. I trust you dreamed well. Sophie sat up, feeling a crimp in her neck. She massaged her throbbing forehead. What had happened to her? She remembered running to the bookshop, calling for her father, and finding Madame Eldritch waiting for her. And then, You drugged me, she said. Madame Eldritch did not bother trying to deny it. I thought it would make it easier to transport you. You mean abduct, Sophie said. She grabbed the door handle and pulled with all of her might, but it was locked. Stop the carriage, she called, pounding her fist against the driver's window. I'm being kidnapped. Madame Eldritch made no move to stop her. She waited until Sophie had exhausted herself before speaking. Your efforts are wasted. The man driving this carriage has been paid too well to be moved by the pleas of a little girl. However, calmly she may be. Her eyes flickered down to Sophie's clothes. Sophie looked at herself and noticed that her plain dress had been replaced with a fine gown that pinched at the waist. Her neck and shoulders were bare and she felt exposed even in the dim light. Mercifully, she saw that she had been equipped with a hooded cloak and a pair of leather boots. That, at least, was something. Why am I dressed like this, she said. Forgive the liberty, your frock was torn and it was, Madame Eldridge paused to consider the word, disadvantageous. Sophie understood the implication and it might have been true for someone like Madame Eldridge, but not for Sophie. A gown's not very practical for travel, she said, pulling her cloak tightly over her shoulders. I think in time you will disagree. Madame Eldridge leaned closer in the manner of a person wanting to share a secret. Here is a lesson for you, little bookmender. A walled garden must have a lattice gate. Before a woman can be desired, she must reveal a bit of what makes her desirable. She reached across the cavern and drew a curl of dark hair from behind Sophie's ear, laying it artfully down her bare neck. Sophie pulled away and retucked the hair behind her ear. I'm not a garden, and I have no interest in being desired. Madame Eldridge did not laugh outright, but looked as if she wanted to. Everyone wants to be desired. It is only a question of for what and by whom. Sophie had no energy to debate the point. She sat up and peered out the round window in the carriage door. A half moon shone above the receding trees. It was a different moon from the night in the Oubliette, and she realized that then had been traveling for at least two days. Where are we, she said. Can you not tell by the stars? We are taking the eastern road through the Grimwald. The Grimwald? The name was enough to make Sophie shudder. She peered again through the window, looking for signs of danger in the moonlit forest. You're not afraid of the wild beasts or the highwaymen? There were, of course, rumors of much more dangerous things lurking in the Grimwald, but Sophie preferred not to consider them. I do not fear the darkness, nor should you. Excuse me. Our door is securely locked, as you already know, and our driver carries a musket. 
at the ready. And if that is not enough, we have Mr. Taro. She looked finally at the creature sitting silently beside her. Sophie studied the manservant who had spared her on the docks. He was now wearing a black velvet suit that looked appropriate for a footman or a valet. She tried to read some explanation on his face, but it was impossible to see anything beyond the silver thread that held his lips together. The very sight of it made her ill. So remember, Taro, your lips are sealed with string. Sophie sighed, flopping down back in her seat. Even if she could escape, there would be little hope of making it back to Bustleburg before Taro intervened. Where are you taking me, she asked, her body rocking with the motion of the carriage. We're going to visit someone who will take a great interest in this book of yours. Madame Eldritch's hand rested casually atop the book of who? One red fingernail playing at the latch? Someone who will pay handsomely for it, I think. Sophie stared at the book. Her book. Perhaps the only hope she had of learning about her mother. Did you read it? Madame Eldritch smiled. I am a simple shopkeeper. The contents of this book are irrelevant to me. I am only concerned with its value. So you're just going to sell it off for money? Money is vulgar but useful. It hired this carriage, for example. Still, you are right. I hope to exchange this book for something that cannot otherwise be bought. Something no bank or coffee can can hold. She said this as she said many things in a way that implied some illicit secret. But where are we going is not your real question, I think. What you want to know is why. If I already have the book, did I also bring you? Sophie shrugged. I assume you're planning to sell me too. The woman shook her head. It is a weakness of sentiment, perhaps. She drew her finger along the curve of Sophie's chin. I am liberating you. A girl like you does not belong in that dusty little bookshelf. Bookshop, I mean, sorry. Of course I belong in that dusty little bookshop, Sophie said, pulling back. I'm a bookmender. I have it on good authority that your position in the city was not exactly one would call secure. Sophie thought that Madame Eldridge must have learned about her flight from the Inquisitor Prig. Besides, you are no common bookmender. You're the daughter of Coriander Choir. Among discerning populations, your mother was the only bookmender. The last person who could repair a book without letting its magic slip away. Sophie sat up, suddenly listening much more closely. The woman must have read the wonder on her face, for she went on. People traveled great distances to commission Coriander Choir, and many of us were disappointed to lose your services. You, like your mother, possess a rare and valuable talent, one that might serve me well. Sophie recalled the look on Madame Eldridge's face whenever she returned. Excuse me, a repaired book to the woman. Ah, uh, and a touch of envy. So I'm to be your servant, she said. I already have a servant, Madame Eldridge leaned back. What I seek in you is a protege. There is much I can teach you about the world. There are places and things beyond your well-fed imagination. Things too fantastic even for books. Well, most books. She glanced meaningfully at the book of who. Sophie folded her arms and stared out the window. I suppose I should have sold that book to you when you gave me the chance. You do me injury, little bookmender. I am no thief. Reach into your pocket. Sophie looked down to find that her dress, ridiculous though it was indeed, had pockets. She reached into the left pocket and removed a leather bundle, rolled up and secured with a ratty cord. What is it, she asked. A gift. Sophie untied the cord and opened the bundle. Inside lay a row of tools. Hand clamps, pincers, and all leather punch, paste spoons, and brushes. They're book mending tools, she said. Such tools were not expensive, but something about these nonetheless filled her with hushed awe. They belong to your mother, Madame Eldred said. Sophie looked up at the woman, unsure whether she was being mocked, but when she turned back to the tools and placed her fingers over them, she knew. There are legends beyond counting of enchanted objects that hold this sort of memory, swords that still ring with the screams of their victims, boots that still creak with roads long since trod, and apparently, in this case, bookbending tools that bore the imprint of Sophie's mother's hand. How did you get them? She gave them to me, Madame Eldritch made a small shrug as if mirroring Sophie's own surprise. It must have been a dozen years ago. She came to my shop and asked me to prepare a great number of very powerful charms. She did not have money to offer, so instead, she gave me those tools. 
So the mom, Sophie's mom, came to Madame Eldridge, wanted these really powerful charms, but didn't have the money. So instead, gave her book mending tools. Sophie shifted in her seat. What were the charms for? They were protective charms. Guarding against all manner of harm. Fire, ice, wind, earth, steel, spark, poison, disease. The ghastly gamut. I did not ask her intentions, but it seemed to me that she was planning to do something dangerous that very night. Something from which she feared she might not return. Sophie recalled what her father had told her about the night her mother left. The charms didn't work, she said, looking down. My father found her in the shop. Dead. Madame Eldridge raised an eyebrow. Then she must have encountered something very powerful indeed. And all the more fitting that I return these tools to you now. Consider it a refund. She smiled, not unkindly. All charms guaranteed. Sophie ran her fingers down the tools. I thank you. But as soon as she said she, these words, she regretted it. This was the same woman who tried to trap her in her oubliette. The same woman who had drugged her in her bookshop. She massaged the spot in her forehead where Madame Eldridge's lips had touched her. Papa would never let you take him from take me from him. Did you kiss him too? The woman made a non-committal gesture with her hand. For him, I employed a more subtle attack. She turned to her manservant, who remained so still that Sophie had nearly forgotten he was in the carriage with them. Mr. Taro, Macalage. Taro nodded and produced a black box with a silver handle on the top. He opened the case to reveal a collection of oils and powders and implements that one might find on the counter of a fine lady's dressing room. The bottles clinked as the carriage rattled beneath them. We're going to end right with that, guys. One, I told you I'd make the chapters a little bit shorter, so we'll finish the next half tomorrow. Two... I just really hope you guys are following along in this book. I think it's really interesting. I'm really interested in it. And I think you guys would really enjoy it if you guys sat down and listened to it. Okay? Talk to you later. Bye.